in talking about the Bible in making ethical decisions. Hollinger provides some important material in this chapter 7 uh, because with all of the things we've uh, been looking at the past couple of chapters, for example in Ray, uh, this really brings us back to our source or our norm. Uh, where do we uh, cover such issues as genetics or reproductive techniques or human cloning? Uh, these are all modern issues that that people struggle with and yet the question is how does one use the Bible then to really find an answer for these? And this can become uh, rather complex, but Hollinger has some helpful uh, insights that I think will take us through this chapter and notice some of what he said. First, he talks about the nature of biblical authority. Um, and the, the, uh, For example, the Bible is a book of moral codes, but it does not address many contemporary issues, as we've already seen in these Ray chapters. He also discusses the Bible as a primary but not the only source. In other words, history, tradition, science are also sources. Um, now, one has to be careful here. Uh, the Bible is always the ultimate source for our ethics, for our theology, for our Christian worldview. Uh, when we use history or tradition, we tend to think of competing religious movements also labeled as Christian and historically Christian really uh, that utilize the pillars of history and tradition as authorities similar to that of Scripture. For example, obviously the Roman Catholic Church in the canons of the Council of Trent in the 16th century uh, took care to define tradition as an alternate method of revelation uh, that is authoritative for the believing Christian. Uh, the great Cardinal Newman, who converted to Catholicism from Anglicanism, uh, argued that uh, uh, the Church has the right to enunciate as beliefs uh, uh, those things that have been held by Christians in the past. And so, for example, then you have such beliefs as the Assumption of Mary uh, or the uh, Immaculate Conception, uh, uh, various views that uh, have come into Catholic theology at a later date, some as early as the 1950s. But Newman would simply argue that these beliefs represent the implicit faith of Christians and therefore deserve an authority alongside that of Scripture. So then in the Catholic tradition, one sees tradition and history as two equal sources. Same thing also with the Eastern Orthodox, who would uh, not have a, uh, a central figure as the ultimate source of um, authority, but they would have what the church has always believed. So Cyprian's dictum, we believe what the church has believed at all times and all places uh, and by all people. And so then tradition becomes very important in fashioning the beliefs of those two large groups of Christians. However, those of us who are not Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox also have tradition. It takes on a slightly different hue. Uh, for Protestantism, for those who followed in the steps of people like Calvin and Luther and Wesley and what have you. Um, tradition is important, but tradition assumes the commentary of what the church has always believed about Scripture. In other words, it's not an independent auxiliary uh, customizing of a human experience. It is rather a historical account of what people have generally held or taught in the church about Scripture. So we have tradition as Protestants, but we don't use it quite the same way or label it or define it the same way as, say, in the Catholic or Orthodox traditions. So, but tradition is important. And so when we look at some of these ethical issues, it does not hurt us to examine what the Church has historically done. For example, the Epistle to Diognetus, uh, one of the very early writings defending the, um, uh, defending the, uh, the traditions and the the truth of Christianity against pagans uh, makes note, for example, of the fact that Christians do not expose their infants. Uh, they do not do away with their children, uh, but rather they live according to a higher creed. Uh, it does not hurt to note that, historically speaking, Christians have held certain views about the sanctity of marriage, the sanctity of human life. So that is tradition, and it is important. And in that sense, you could say certainly the Bible is not only they are only source, but also uh, tradition, what the church has always believed or practiced, is a source, if one understands how we relate those two. And of course, science is also a source. But once again, we face a little divide here. 
What do we mean when we say that science is a source? Um, it's best to say that science is a supplemental evidence that will defend or clarify the true scripture states. But science itself is not an authority that proves scripture, and that's a very important point for Christians to understand. Um, when we begin with scripture, then, as Augustine said, our faith precedes our reason. But the second corollary is our faith will never stultify our reason. So science becomes important because it's a testimony, it's a witness to the authority, the truths we've already accepted in Scripture. So you see, a, a Christian thinker in ethics can use the items, the, the perspectives of history, tradition, and science also as auxiliary sources alongside that of Scripture. And uh, this quote here, uh, there has not ever been a purely Christian morality unalloyed with the experience and traditions of others. And that's very, very true. Uh, we all today have experienced traditions, uh, histories that we come from. And I think the main problem is, is when we so emphasize the uh, tradition, our own personal journeys, our experiences, that we overturn the principle of uh, biblical interpretation or religious understanding, making the meaning of God's will or the meaning of God's word itself dependent upon how our community interprets that word. At that point, it's gone too far, and you're into the new hermeneutic, people like Hans Georg Gadamer, and uh, the idea that uh, uh, theology is simply merely an expression of our opinion. And that's carrying a little too far. It's called story theology. Uh, theology is a story, but it has to be a story based upon Scripture as the ultimate authority. So uh, that's very important for theology. In ethics, however, it's also important to realize you don't want to just throw out those past human experiences. You don't want to discard the experience of the church. All of that is of great value to us. And, of course, the classical view is the Bible as the inspired word of God speaks to all cultures and time. And that's not objectionable. Uh, and there is a sense in which it does speak to all cultures. Uh, the Old Testament, for example, is patterned after ancient Near Eastern law codes and customs. Uh, for example, the Code of Hammurabi, uh, uh, Hittite suzerainty treaties. Uh, these are general methods of communicating or understanding uh, covenant agreements between a people and its ruler. And the Old Testament bears witness to these. Uh, ancient Near Eastern suzerainty treaties the Code of Hammurabi in, and what should probably have been supplied here, for example, in uh, Joshua, uh, perhaps 24, uh, or in other sections where specific punishments are uh, noted for specific crimes. But the idea is, is that there's a generally uh, common way in which people during the time the Old Testament was being written would relate to their God. And the Old Testament bears witness to this in that you have the Old Testament sanctions, uh, the great Old Testament passages in which people promise loyalty to their king, and they will fill the conditions of the covenant the king is making with them. So uh, the Bible spoke to that culture, spoke to that time, in a way that was consistent with that. But here's the hermeneutical issues. <clears throat> Many contemporary issues are not addressed. So to what extent can we apply culture-specific texts in the Bible that perhaps... Uh, uh, do not uh, are not as a, uh, clearly understood in our own time. For example, Psalm 51:5. Uh, but is David's point here the origin of the soul? Uh, is is this what he means? I was conceived in sin, born in iniquity. Uh, is he talking about here the origin of the soul, or is he talking about the innate condition of humanity as it comes into this life? So, Jeremiah 1:5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Well, if this is true, then would we have to believe in the pre-existence of the soul, like Origen did, the idea that souls have a pre-existent state and then they come and God sends them into our being? Obviously, we have to look at uh, Jeremiah 1.5 in the terms of uh, Hebrew imagery, a very poetic way of expressing God's overall knowledge of all of us. Psalm 139 is interesting. God treats the unborn with special care and protection. And in Luke 1.41, the term baby is the same as that of an older child. Uh, so that when Elizabeth uh, had her encounter with God, uh, the baby 
John the Baptist leaped in her womb. Uh, the idea here is the term baby, the scripture's term is what leaped in Elizabeth's womb is the same as that of an older child. In other words, it was not a less stature or a, less, a lesser level. It was regarded as the same. So uh, we can use some of these scriptures to speak to the Christian worldview about how we value uh, unborn life uh, and about how we value God's presence uh, to know us in that life, even from the point of our very beginning. Uh, so they can be applied, but we have to understand what they are saying and use them in a very, in a very correct way. And of course, there are some times in which issues in Scripture may not be the same as the same issues today. Uh, for example, usury. Uh, there were, these were personal loans between family and kin with the goal of protecting the poor. Uh, and uh, uh, so the idea here is, uh, is in banking wrong. Uh, what the Old Testament is probably talking about uh, is misusing loans between family and kin and perhaps disadvantaging uh, the poor in a way that would be selfish. Today's commercial loans, however, are for the benefit of all. So uh, the, uh, the sanctions against usury doesn't necessarily mean, do not necessarily mean that it's wrong to have a bank or to loan money. Although the way the banks have performed the past few years would lead us to wonder if it's not a pretty evil situation, but all that all aside, theoretically speaking, it's not wrong to make a loan. It is wrong to use low money making or money uh, loaning in a way that disadvantages people or is dishonest or is uh, uh, gained toward personal goal in a way that disadvantages them. And then uh, submission to authorities, Romans chapter 13. Uh, Paul tells us we should be submission, su submit to the authorities which God has placed over us. So then in uh, Romans 13, uh, Paul tells us that we should submit to the authorities so that God has placed over us. And yet in Acts, and here's an excellent reference, Acts 51, 25 through 29. And I realized, looking at that, that that must come from the expanded Breckenridge version of the Bible because it's certainly not in ours. However, I think what I meant to say was Acts 5, uh, probably 25 through 29. And this is when uh, the apostles engaged in civil disobedience in response to the government's prohibition of evangelism. In other words, they were told they could not preach, but they went ahead and preached. So the point is, is you cannot take the Bible and produce a, a criterion of a submission to authority which in any way is going to uh, repress the freedom, individual human freedom of the individual to do things like preach the gospel. That's the idea. So that the apostles were not uh, being disloyal to the teachings of the Bible. Rather, they were being loyal to the commission God had given them. And so, once again, uh, Scripture can speak to the contemporary situation. We have to be careful. We understand it, what it means. And then there's the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And ethically, this can really be a problem point, a potential flashpoint for many Christians. For example, in the Old Testament, capital punishment is prescribed for seemingly small offenses. Polygamy is practiced without condemnation. Uh, you have holy wars, the harem it's called, uh, in which uh, uh, in at least a couple of primary occasions, the children of Israel are told to go in and kill everyone there, man, woman, ox, etc., uh, and just wipe people out. So what is the response to this? How does one handle this ethically? Well, we should note that many practices were permitted but not condoned. God seems to work with a culture on the level of that culture throughout history. It's very interesting to me. When God encounters people, <clears throat> regardless of the time period they're in, he brings the gospel, he brings his word, he brings his message but he applies that message within the context of their culture so that uh, he does not uh, then enforce modern methods of rehabilitation upon an Old Testament people who practiced warfare in a certain way. And, uh, Walter J. Kaiser, really an outstanding Old Testament uh, authority, Dr. Kaiser said we need to distinguish between what the Bible records and what it teaches. You have to ask yourself, is the Bible really teaching in the Old Testament? Is it teaching polygamy? Is it teaching holy war? <clears throat> is it teaching capital punishment just for small offenses? Is it really teaching that? 
And so there's also the fact of progressive revelation. The New Testament shows a different attitude, for example, toward marriage. So that when one looks at the, uh, at the Old Testament, one looks at the uh, social situation of those people, uh, the various uh, dimensions, uh, the place of women, uh, the New Testament might, we could say, might show a higher attitude, a different attitude toward marriage than that expressed perhaps in the Old Testament. The safest approach is to understand the Old Testament in light of the New Testament. <clears throat> and if in conflict, then the New Testament takes precedence over the Old. And so that's uh, an overall good recommendation for that. I think it's myself, I feel it's safer to say the Old Testament is written in preparation for the New Testament and that uh, except for the moral law the Old Testament has uh, minimal value for legislating ethics uh, today uh, but that the New Testament is the primary source of Christian uh, fulfillment. <clears throat> and that does not mean the Old Testament is not full of wonderful promises uh, in the poetic books and the Psalms all of these very strong theological positions uh, but I think that we need to understand that uh, to function as a universal law for people, the Old Testament in large part is not applicable because of the drastically different position of God's people in relationship to the divine being between the Old and the New Testament. So I would say that the New Testament has to take precedence over the Old because it represents the fulfillment of God's progressive revelation to us. So when should a text be understood universally? How should we do that then? Well, some commands are given to individuals alone, like, for example, Genesis 12.1. And here God says to Abram, get thee out of thy country, addresses Abram personally, and he proceeds to fulfill God's promise, and as a result, uh, in Genesis 15, experiences God's approval uh, upon him. But then there's also legislative or case laws, such as Exodus chapters 21 through 23. These then are various social laws that, uh, that provide a standard for Israel's society. Uh, so one has things like <clears throat> laws regarding servants, maid servants, uh, murder, other offenses. This is where you have the famous lex talionis, the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth passage, and of course that very argumentative verse, Exodus 21, 22. But these fulfill a need in Israel's social context. Then there's New Testament prohibitions regarding women in the church. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, he notes 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Timothy 2. And what does one do, with, do to these? Uh, uh, does one make these apply equally straight over to today? And of course, a common understanding here is that this may represent a position in Corinth where the uh, spirit of non-Christian beliefs, paganism, uh, may have been strongly associated with feminine deities, so that uh, the feminine deity may have been understood uh, largely by a female principle. And so for this time at this place in the church, perhaps the role of women is restricted, lest uh, the message of the gospel be associated with someone like Aphrodite or uh, uh, some other uh, feminine figure that would represent uh, paganism uh, to uh, the Greeks. So the New Testament is very clear to, uh, to provide this. This, of course, brings up the issue of the role of women in the church today. Should a woman be allowed to preach or to teach? And it would seem to me that just as we have expanding uh, revelation, progressive revelation occurring in the Bible, that the roles that women faced at this time in the church did not allow uh, preaching and teaching. But uh, if we see those roles as somewhat conditioned by the sinful nature of society, then there's no reason the church cannot be about redeeming that sinful society and elevating the women today. And personally, I have no problem with women preaching and teaching in the church, although uh, some very devout people feel that that is just mandatory, that they should not uh, be allowed to do so. But it seems to me that part of the progressive work of the church in restoring people to the place they had before things became so uh, difficult because of sin in the world, uh, that part of that mission of restoration would be to elevate the role of women and elevate the role of all minorities in the church as being agents of the gospel.
And then there are complex issues with multiple biblical issues and paradigms. <clears throat> For example, uh, hiding Jews from the Nazis. Uh, how, what does one do with that? And I think most of us would probably realize that uh, at that point we certainly would not be, uh, want to obey the government. <clears throat> Families who prohibit blood transfusions. Uh, that's going a little far. We all know those religious uh, cults or groups that uh, because of being overly literal about uh, the biblical meaning of blood don't allow things like blood transfusions. Uh, environmental ethics. <clears throat> this is a large point of conflict in our society today and yet part of the great uh, commission given to Adam is to go forth and subdue the world and make it into what it should be. And yet we face uh, serious issues about uh, what is going to uh, be the case in the future in our environment. Uh, so our task then is to look for the biblical principles and ask ourselves what principles can we supply that will be the same that speak to our culture today just as the same as two cultures gone by. And then Hollinger talks about types of biblical ethical guidance. He uses the term casuistic law. Casuistic law are those laws that mandate specific behavior for specific situations. In other words, the more legalistic. And he gives the example here of Exodus 32 and uh, through 36, 23, 10 through 11. Mostly this would be civil case law in which he simply says, this you do, if this happens, you do this. And so if Jesus had used this approach, many teachings would not be applicable to us today, uh, simply because casuistic law takes the overtones of a particular society at a particular time using its social uh, frameworks, its customs, and it's not as universal, not as capable of being universally applied. Apodictic law would be divine commands. Uh, the Greek preposition of Paul meaning from and uh, uh, dictic uh, meaning uh, uh, spoken, uh, something given to us. So apodictic would be divine commands that God has spoken to us. And uh, this, and of course we have this in the form of the Ten Commandments as well as other commandments uh, uh, throughout the Bible. Then there are principles. If you look at the wisdom literature, books like uh, 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 Psalms, Pro uh, Proverbs rather, uh, Proverbs, uh, Ecclesiastes, uh, the Song of Solomon, uh, Job. Uh, this wisdom literature uh, demonstrates a tremendous amount of, of wise principles. Uh, you can spend a whole devotional period simply reading through the book of Proverbs or reading carefully through the, um, uh, through the Song of Solomon, uh, uh, Job, uh, the poetic books. Uh, tremendous, tremendous things that tell us principles we can live by. Uh, in Galatians 3.28, Richard Longnecker notes a cultural mandate, a societal mandate, and a sexual mandate. And I think that what is met here, uh, Longnecker is an outstanding uh, New Testament scholar, just really a, a great thinker uh, for the evangelical faith. But I think he's taking Galatians 3.28, which says, Scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. I think what Longnecker is saying is that this blessing involves a mandate for us to go forth and encounter our culture, uh, to affect our society, uh, and, to, and to make this world uh, beneficial uh, through uh, propagating, through inheriting what God has for us, so that as in the terms of the gospel, what we live under is a mandate to make this world a better place across the entire span of uh, human society. And then, uh, and then Hollinger notes biblical paradigms with implied ethical guidance. Uh, for example, a triune God, uh, even the existence of God in Trinity, implies a, an ethical guidance, a, an agreement, a universality, a unanimity of purpose so that God is not this unknown solitary thing floating in the universe but that we actually have the idea of personality, of morality, of judgment, of decision making, all in the being of God uh, in, as expressed in the Trinity. And then the other uh, paradigm of course is a flawed humanity which needs governance and if we look at the history then of humanity obviously that would be um, uh, that would be pretty specific. Matthew 24, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, a nation shall rise against nation. 
and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be wars, and and all, and but uh, and these things will must surely be. Uh, so we have a flawed humanity. Uh, Richard Hayes, uh, in a book, The Moral Vision of the New Testament, uh, quite an impressive volume, sees three focal images that summarize New Testament ethics, and that basically is community, cross, and the new creation. And so all of those things should be certainly present in our ethics, in our churches, in our teaching, as we look at how the Bible affects uh, the uh, doing of ethics within the Christian worldview. Some more examples of narratives, for example, the stories of the Bible. What about those? But many are about moral failures, Abraham's lie, David's adultery, Ananias and Sapphira. But how should these be used? What do you do with all those stories of the, you know, the people who fail God? Well, how should these be used? Well, first understand them in light of the overarching story of the Bible. And note the broader context. Uh, Genesis for example, 20, for example, condemns Abraham's uh, action in lying. Uh, about, I believe this is about his sister, uh, uh, his wife, uh, claiming to be his sister. Uh, examine the outcomes of the story. For example, Abraham and Hagar, what was the outcome? Assess the story in terms of other forms of biblical laws and governance. And always give hermeneutical and normative priority to the narratives of Jesus. Uh, people ask the question, what would Jesus do? And sometimes that can be a little tricky because Jesus didn't drive around the cars that we do. He didn't live in the modern age that we do. You, so sometimes difficult to say, well, what would Jesus do? However, if you look at the narratives of Jesus and how he lived, the spirit that he conveyed, we can indeed ask the question, what would Jesus do? That's another way of saying if an act is redemptive, if it's truly redemptive, perhaps it's good. So conclusion, the safest approach is to look first to direct or clear guidance on an issue and then bring together the other forms of ethical guidance with an understanding that Scripture interprets Scripture. We must interpret the part in light of the whole with special attention to the fuller revelation in Christ and the apostolic witness of the New Testament. And that, that's well said, not a lot of improvement there. You start with the Scripture. If you don't know what the Scripture means, then see how that Scripture is understood, the words that you're having in question. See how those words are understood throughout the rest of the canonical material, the Bible. You start there. And then if there's no uh, better solution, if you have one of those unusual times when the word is only used one time in the Bible, then look at further literature and, and pull out your um, Kittle's Theological Dictionary and other sources and see how it's used generally in, in the world at that time. But the point is to arrive at some understanding then of uh, how Scripture uh, is to be interpreted, keeping in mind that there's always special attention to that fuller revelation of Christ and the apostolic witness of the New Testament.